Hey YouTube, warbles on a lot here. We're coming up to time for Outsiders and the first dog on the moon. And I think the topic for today is going to be Tony Abbott's terrorism prime ministership. I'm not entirely certain, but I think that's what's on the program. And the message this morning is, we are not alone. A quiet fear is stalking much of the world. As the New York Times reports, France wants more power to block its citizens from leaving the country, while Britain is weighing whether to stop more of its citizens from coming home. Tunisia is debating measures to make it a criminal offence to help jihadist fighters travel to Syria and Iraq, while Russia has outlawed enlisting in armed groups that are, quote, contradictory to Russian policy. Everyone has their concerns about Islamic State. Oh, uh, and by the way, why do we call them that? It's a good question. And one The Guardian is asking this morning. The Prime Minister and media should stop legitimising the terror group rampaging through Syria in Iraq by describing it as Islamic State, according to a coalition of imams and organisations representing British Muslims. The argument being... Use of the jihadis' preferred title, they argue, gives credibility to the Sunni militants and slurs the Islamic faith. We, of course, are way ahead of this sort of thinking in Australia, where we've taken the simple expedient of referring to ISIS, ISIL, IS as that muzzo death cult. Which takes us to the front of this morning's Sunday Telegraph, a newspaper page that in several centuries might serve as a tidy summary of our moment in time. And this is the great gift of newspaper pages like today's Sunday Telly, page one, a calculated smorgasbord of popular culture, elements selected and tweaked to tickle the instinctive fancies of the widest possible audience. An advertisement, a bulletin, but also a mirror. This is you, Sydney, a city thrilled by half-naked rugby league footballers. Beach, bunny and the mountain man. No, I'm not sure either. A city besotted by celebrities. Starstruck. Sydney goes crazy for Kardashians. That's crazy with a K, by the way, because nothing says contemporary cool like made-up spelling. A city quick to be censorious. Exclusive. Coach horn parties. Australian swimming's dark secret reveals. Of course, a city being trained by the likes of the Sunday Telegraph to live in a certain amount of fear. Security alert after terror threat to dig it in CBD. That was the story, and the Sunday's telly subs toyed with two main headlines, heading early editions with, We'll blow you away, before adding a blot of red ink and something subtly more active and menacing. Can't wait to kill you. It's the story of how a Defence Force member was threatened by a group of young men in the Sydney CBD. The ADF member was approached by a group of young men and told to go to the Middle East so we can blow your head off. And that, wedged between the Kardashians and the coach porn parties, it's a tale for our times. As is the front of this morning's Brisbane Sunday Mail, which has its own take on... Swim scandal, strippers... Fleas and porn. As well as the simultaneously sad and scary tale of Sisters in Arms, Berta Brigade take up weapons on the front line. The story here? Gold Coast raised Amira Karoom was fighting on the front line for the Islamic State with her husband Tyler Casey when she was shot and hacked to death in Syria. Which just goes to show that beneath the newspaper's breezy Berta Brigade lies an unexplored layer. A simple, universal family tragedy. And now the moment you've been waiting for. Tweet of the week. Yes, indeed. Uh, what did you make of our mystery tweeter? Here's one more listen. Yes. That bird's no lifter, that bird's a leaner. And it's found across the south and the east of the continent. Congratulations to Harry O'Donovan, who was first to guess correctly, or not guess, who knew? It is the fantailed cuckoo. <clears throat> Cacomantis, flabiliformis, if you don't.
don't mind. I had a lot of trouble with that because it was hyphenated in the middle of the screen. And that's a long word. Spring is upon us. Fantail cuckoos, they're out and about. And now you know exactly what they sound like. And why Alina? Well, they're not particularly good in the whole parenting thing. The, the fantail cuckoo, um, well, they look for mates. They prepare. They lay a single egg in the nest of a flycatcher or a wren or a thornbill, and soon after that, the cuckoo chick will hatch and push the host eggs out of the nest. <sighs> Free meal for the unsuspecting foster parents, sisters and leaners. It's a tough world out there in nature. More Tweet of the Week next Sunday, just after the 9 o'clock news. Time now for Outsiders. I'm Barry Cassidy, and you're not. And your attention-starved outsiders for this week are Chris Bird, Policy Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, John Watson, Politics and Society Editor at The Conversation, uh, which is an independent news and analysis website, and Beth Wilson, she's the former Health Services Commissioner for Victoria. Welcome to you all. Uh, we were going to talk terror and, and the heightened state of readiness, and that takes on a, a, a special... Uh, well, a special urgency, I guess, again this morning, a new video released from IS claiming to show, in fact, showing the beheading of a third prisoner. It's a British aid worker, David Payne. And he has said in his, his very sad video that he holds David Cameron entirely responsible for his execution. This, Chris Berg, is, is the thing the, the West is grappling with, this thing of... of culpability of, of what to do and of whether the doing encourages or whether the doing will remove the threat of yeah. Islamic State? There, there are two choices that we have to make. First of all, we have to decide how we tackle the changing terror environment at home domestically. So um, the existence of foreign fighters in Iraq and Syria does actually change that calculation a bit. Um, and that has been what uh, not just the Australian government, but other governments around the world have been doing. And then we have the broader, perhaps more complex and more unanswerable question about, um, given that this is happening in um, countries to an extent that uh, uh, we haven't seen before or we, we feel that is so unusual, then can we intervene? And if we intervene, can, will, will we at all be successful? Uh, uh, and one of the problems with <coughs> having foreign interventions for a long time is that we have counterproductive consequences, some of which end up being the very problem that we are now rather trying to trying to tackle. But you know, you've got this this moral problem, and and no one should, whether you're on the interventionist side or the non-interventionist side, no one should ignore the fact that there are extraordinarily bad things happening around the world, and particularly yeah. in Iraq and Syria, that we have at least the capacity to. Doing something about it in a very short term. The question is, you know, how, what happens in the medium term? Well, that's a very confronting moral issue for, for the West very broadly. I mean, they've been taking the foreign policy out of it, Beth. When you, when you see something like the Prime Minister's press conference last week where the, the, the terror level is raised, I mean, how are we as, as ordinary punters in this country supposed to respond to that? What, I mean, what's that about? It's very difficult to know how to respond when you don't know what the information is that um, has caused this raising of the terror alert. Mm. I was last week in Cairns. Um, I was there as patron of the Continents Foundation of Australia. And I was a little starved of good print media. I had that citadel of um, investigative journalism, the Cairns Post, and that totally unbiased journal, The Australian, as my sources of information. So I thought... Well, the Australian's big on continents. And, mm, well, yes, it covers the continent, but anyway. <laughs> so I thought I might go to the grassroots level and get some advice from um, from a little focus group that I set up in Coco's Bar at the um, Pullman International. I had eight continents nurses. Um, we had a glass of champagne each and talked about what this might mean for us. The last from Shepparton, she reckoned that Shep probably all right for the moment. And the last from Chadston, which she called the vanilla flight, suburb. She didn't think there was any imminent terror at Chadston just yet. Yes, I think the, the, the fundamental message, and this is, uh, well, the Prime Minister said this as well, is, is to take these words very much to heart. I want to stress that the 
for the vast majority of Australians, um, the, the rise in the threat level uh, from medium to high will not make any difference to daily life. Well, to put that uh, another way entirely. Don't panic! Don't panic! Don't, don't panic! You're all right! Yes, we ought not panic, but John Watson, this is a this is a strange. I mean, there's, there's strange messages in this. We we are raising the the alert to a level where we think that a, a an attack is likely, and yet we are being told that there is no specific information pertaining to any particular threat. I mean, that says something about the gradations of threat level. Well, the gradations of threat level uh, is is a big part of it. I mean, I think the proportionality of our response. Is almost an inverse proportion to how safe we are as a country originally. We're not used to feeling threatened. So, uh, you know, I mean, there are so many more ways you can threaten. I, I rebuked my wife this week for not being either alert or alarmed when she got stung by a bee when she picked up the, the hose. Uh, because the danger to Australians on the record of the past decade, which has been a very turbulent decade, is that more people have got killed in by bees now than by sharks and shrews and tourists. Now, and, yet, and yet the possibility, if, if, if it exists, and, and you know, why, why would we not take the agencies at their word that it doesn't oh, exist? The possibility because that's, is their, that's their job. Totally chilling. But it's, it's, not, it's still, you know, I trust them to do their job, and they've done it very effectively for a decade, but let's not forget too that they also. But I've got a few original question of when the attack is likely. Why was David Irvine moving a week before lifting the level that an attack was likely? Right. If he felt so at that moment that an attack was likely when he was moving about it, why did the level not start right well, yeah, I mean, uh, look, look, the, the terror alert level is a political statement. Now, a political statement, not necessarily in a negative way, but it is a statement made to, uh, made to indicate to people that something has changed. Now, we know that something, we know from our own publicly available information that things actually have changed. Why, why, why does that have to be made publicly? Why, why does the public need to be apprised of a difference in, in the level of alert? I mean, that, that's, what can we do about that? Well, there's probably very little that you and I can do, um, uh, but there have been some suggestions that, you know, add more security to public events and so forth. Now, I think most of that stuff is symbolic. A lot of it is entirely security theater, but the, um, the terror alert level is supposed to be a very strange way of communicating the changing terror threat to us in a world that we don't understand, that we can't understand because of, uh, of secrecy constraints, which, which is always the problem with national security. Well, the number of the question for me is what are we supposed to do? It's a bit of a mean raising of the threshold because no fridge magnets, no little show bags like we've got from John Howard. I've raced home from Cairns and searched all the doors for my little magnet, but I'm afraid it's gone. But that is an important question of, of what it is that we might reasonably, constructively, in this environment, do. Well, at the risk of being too cynical, I think if you looked at the press conference that announced the raising of the threat level, the person in the position closest to Tony Abbott was a person in full military or reaction police regalia, but with a full uniform and the or the insignia. To be fair, that's his uniform. Yeah, but he was. <laughs> no, that, that, the point was he was there positioned is closest yeah. to Tony Abbott rather than in the background. Yeah. I, I think this is theatre. This, this is. Because, as I say, I, I actually trust the intelligence services to do the job, I trust the military to do the job, but I don't actually see why the politicians have to be involved in it unless they're asking for, for a specific response. It's the, the theatre to the very point that the bomb goes off or that the, the Australian soldiers and I don't know, if, if, if they said to me, Mr. Williams, if they said to me, we're raising the alert, and this is what we want from Australians, you won't have to do, do this differently, you won't have to do this differently, but the message is completely opposite. Go about your normal business. Well, the problem is that we don't know what we have to do differently. No, but, but the problem is, the, uh, as in they don't know what they want us to do differently. We are talking about outside long risk. So um, they know that the Outside long risk is slightly lowered, there's more, or, or slightly raised. Um, uh, there's more of a chance that something could happen, they don't know what it is, and so they're just telling us. Now, I don't, uh, I'm sounding like a really anti terror sort of guy here, but I'm, uh, I'm quite civil libertarian. But the point is that we can't come to these arguments not recognizing that things have changed and not recognizing the basic political problems that they have in communicating. But that oh, they, they, have changed. So the basic question is why do terrorists do things in, 
in such an atrocious way and post them on the web. They do it because we've actually compared to a nation state very powerless. They rely on us picking that up and magnifying their influence and their terror. Because if we if a tree falls in the forest and not in the desert, does it fall? If, if a terrorist does something crazy somewhere horrific and we completely ignore it, yeah. how much effect does that terrorist have beyond the person that they kill? And yet, and yet Beth, that, that sort of thing, not only is it, is it driven into our consciousness by its extremity and, and its, its, its graphicness, and just as, as simple video and news, but it's also driven into our consciousness by the political process that, that is, it is waved before us as a, as a rationale. Yes, and I think the real horror is that one person, that poor fellow um, tied up and bound and the big bully in black about to have his throat cut. It's, it's, it's awful. awful. He is white. And one of yeah. us too. Because there's been thousands slaughtered in Iraq and Syria in very similar fashion. And we didn't really we didn't care. Well, hundreds of thousands in Syria to this point. Well, I'm talking about the... the well, I mean, to be, fair, John, no, to be fair, the entire debate about whether we should intervene in Iraq and Syria isn't so we can intervene to save one or two hostages yeah, yeah, because yeah. there's a humanitarian crisis going on. So but I don't think I don't think it's fair to say that we we only care about them if they're. But I'm talking about the emotional response where we regard it as an imminent threat. You know, it's, it's coming at us now. Yeah, and I don't think people need to feel ashamed of that. Um, if someone's killed in your street you feel that much more immediately and it's much more terrifying than a hundred in another country where, you, you, you know, it's an imminent threat to you. And the reassuring point, I think, in, in this, and this goes back to that, that, that foreign relations aspect of this, is that the, the response thus far, it seems to be cautious, measured, incremental, difficult to do. Um, we're not sort of rushing in as we might once have done. Well, I, I think there are two parts again. Again, we've got the domestic and foreign policy response. I think you're right that we're not rushing in. Um, the, this is uh, a, a rapid problem that has developed over the course of months, and we're not jumping straight into it, and that's a good thing. But we are also talking about um, uh, reams and reams of new national security legislation, which is the which is going on at the background as we have this discussion about what are we going to do about ISIS, well, which is where the, 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 our sense of this is it's possibly useful that we yeah yeah no no and, and 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 I think that much of what is being proposed by the government is is seriously bad. Um, there are some seriously concerning. That's all to come. And, and as we're hearing this morning from the, the attorney in the next parliamentary sitting fortnight, more of that legislation, uh, this debate will run and run. Let's hope that it has no concrete outcome. <coughs> error wise outsiders this morning have been Chris Berg, he's policy director at the IPA, John Watson, he's politics and society editor of The Conversation, and Beth Wilson, she's former health services commissioner for the great state of Victoria. Five minutes away, you <laughs> can. Welcome to day 1897 of the Royal Commission into Trade Union Governance and Corruption. Uh, let's just get proceedings underway right away, shall we? Uh, your first witness, Mr. Nightjar. Uh, thank you, British Governor. The first witness, Julia Gillard. Please state your name for the record. Oh, oh sorry. I wasn't listening. It's, it's just so very exciting to be here. Please state your name for the record. Uh, uh, Julian Gillard. And you are currently a resident of South Australia. Yes, yes, that's right. And you were Prime Minister from June 2010 to June 2013. Oh, oh, oh not again. I'm sorry. Oh, this, is, this is always happening to me. I, I don't quite follow. <laughs> you see, I, I'm actually Julian Gillard with a U. You're thinking of Jelia Gillard, who was Prime Minister from June 2010 to June 2013. She, you probably couldn't tell who I was because I'm wearing this chicken suit. Well, well yes, that, that actually was my next question. Uh, why the former Prime Minister chose to attend the Royal Commission dressed as a chicken? Well, yes, well, she didn't. Uh, not that it would have been out of character, because apparently lots of former PMs like to suit up as some kind of poultry. I heard it took them three months to get John Howard out of his spatchcock outfit after he finally lost in 2007. Uh, 
Commissioner, there, there seems to be uh, some kind of mistake. But Mr. Nightjar, are you suggesting that you've wasted the Commission's time by calling the wrong person? And rather than getting a former Prime Minister, as we were expecting, we have a man dressed as a chicken? Uh, well, of course not, Commissioner. I'm sure Mr. Gallard has information relevant to the current proceedings. No, I certainly do. I know, I know all about Royal Commissions, but let me tell you, it's a hobby of mine. For instance, did you know there have been 132 Federal Royal Commissions since 1902? However, the record holder is South Australia, who has held 237 Royal Commissions since 1859. I see. No, look, seriously, there have been some absolute rippers, like the 1979 Royal Commission into the floodlighting of Football Park at Westlake, and then in 1944 there was a Royal Commission into Milk in Schools, that was a cracker. And I should point out to your listeners, though, that I'm not making any of these Royal Commissions up. Yes, Mr. Gallard, but, but do you have any information that might relate to the subject of this Royal Commission? Oh, well, well funnily enough, this one reminds me of the 1893 Royal Commission into vermin proof fences. Although it's also reminiscent of the 1891 Royal Commission inquiring into the alleged injuries by sparrows, and for that matter, the 1904 Royal Commission into the butter industry. Eerily similar, in fact. Oh, thank you, Mr. Gallard. Uh, do you have any information relating to former Prime Minister Gillard's home renovations, which took place over 20 years ago? Oh, well, yes, I know you should always get invoices and receipts. I mean, everyone knows those are two different things. And what sort of shifty character doesn't get three quotes for a renovation? Anything more specific? Oh, well, as they said at the 1891 Royal Commission on the question of the best route for the Blythe Railway extension, if you look at these paint swatches, I think we can all agree that Saharan Husky is a much milder shade of orange than Tuscan Cantaloupe and would be far more suitable for an upstairs bathroom in a Fitzroy Terrace. So are you saying that if you had your time over again, you would do it differently? If, say, you, you had a, a, a time machine. Oh, oh, heavens no. No, if I had a time machine, I'd head straight to the 1892 Royal Commission into whether or not any public loss had been occasioned or permitted in connection with the pastoral valuations by the misconduct, negligence, incapacity or error of Mr. S.J. Clemmett. Thank you for your time, Mr. Gallard. Oh, are you saying I don't have any further questions to answer? How disappointing. Can I get a selfie with the Commissioner? Well, there you go. At some point, somebody should sit our Prime Minister and President Obama and uh, what's his name in, in the United Kingdom, Cameron? should set them down and explain to them the history of how it was that American air power lost the Vietnam War. I seem to recall there was, there was an example given in a book called The 10,000 Day War, which covered the period of time from when the Japanese occupying French Indochina surrendered to a British colonel on the ground and the British colonel said, well, thanks very much, but the atom bomb comes as a great surprise and we don't have anybody out here to police the territory. So the British rearmed the Japanese and used them as colonial or occupation troops until the French colonial occupation could be reinstigated at the end of the Second World War because America and England wanted France to join NATO and therefore the French had to be made to feel like they hadn't lost anything during the period of the Nazi occupation. Um, so yeah, from then until the time in 1975 when the regime in South Vietnam finally expired, there was about 10,000 days. And there, there was a, a description in there of how it was considered a great victory by the Americans if they got a squadron of single-seat supersonic jet fighter bombers, which were designed to deliver nuclear warheads, and they protected them with two squadrons of supersonic jet air superiority fighters, and they had a couple of uh, command and 
command and control surveillance aircraft, electronic warfare jamming aircraft involved as well. <coughs> and they'd set this entire aerial caravan in the sky, launched either from Thailand or from aircraft carriers off the coast, and they'd sail in to the what they called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was the supply route for the South Vietnamese communists. And they would invest all these aeroplanes, which cost at the time, oh, we're talking two or three, maybe five million dollars per aircraft. The crew were costing a million dollars each to train. The cheap bombs were around about the ten thousand dollars, but there were some primitive laser guided bombs that were up around the hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollar mark. And they would drop several million dollars worth of bombs. They would lose one or two aircraft with crew that would then get to spend time in, in horrendous conditions of captivity. Sometimes they would get to throw away a couple of helicopters and a few more aircraft trying to extract the shot down crews from behind enemy lines. And they would claim that it was a great victory because they had destroyed a $500 bamboo bridge that could be rebuilt overnight with unskilled labor. And therefore they had degraded the communists capability to supply the insurgent guerrilla terrorists who were busy taking South Vietnam away from the post-French colonial corrupt crony capitalist government in Saigon. And we're in a similar situation with Tony, the Muslim terrorist prime minister, is that's, that's how he's going to go down in history. He's the, the prime minister who has expressed the most fear of the most Muslims because terrorism is on his mind. He's, 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 a, he's a, a, a terrorism prime minister. He's in a situation where because an expatriate Australian who wanted to go and fight for the caliphate or ISIL, which is what President Obama is calling it these days, the Islamic State of Levant. So anywhere where the people are swarthy and have large hook noses and black hair and brown eyes, that, that's, that's where the Islamic State wants to rule according to President Obama. But anyway, an Australian bloke goes over there, traveling on his brother's passport, and he gets his wife and kids to follow him. And then he puts pictures of himself and his kid and his kids holding the decapitated head of somebody. There's, no information as to how the head was disembodied but anyway that simple picture has caused the Australian prime Muppet to spend millions of dollars in attempting to react so it's cost that bloke in Syria the price of a Facebook connection to put his picture up there and Australia is pissing money up against the wall, running around in circles, trying to bite ourselves in the tail, thinking up something we can do to react against it. And in the process, alienating every disaffected Muslim young man who exists in the western suburbs of Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne and Western Australia or wherever it is that they keep them unemployed Muslim youth in, in Perth. The, the the people who may have thought they had a chance of saving up their pennies and going over there to fight what they think of as the good fight and being safely off our shores, no, then they know they're now locked up and the government is expecting them to do something violent and therefore they can expect to be racially profiled and targeted on the streets by every white police officer who ever held a prejudice. Now, how long is that mixture going to be allowed to ferment and stew <coughs> and basically go mouldy before some bubbles of actual discontent rise up in the form of somebody blowing something up. Because it won't be nearly as big an explosion if, if some discontented suburban Muslim malcontent organises it as it is when, you know, it's an agricultural company with a B-double full of ammonium nitrate to crash against a bridge. And we do get large explosions in Australia in civilian daily life, but it's not the extremists who are doing it. 
it's the uh, the agro cultists who want to transport 50 tonnes of fertiliser around in one go. That's who's blowing up the countryside in Australia. And of course, nobody's given David Irvine a disciplinary interview for throwing Australia into, into turmoil with his musings a week ago about how the terrorist threat level might have to be raised because it's likely that somebody might do something that might cause injury to somebody because there's something happening on the other side of the world. I'm sorry, Australia has a terrorism driven prime minister. He's relying on terrorism for his own political purposes. He's relying on people in the Middle East to be terrified at the prospect of Australia sending forth one entire squadron of super hornets and maybe a few commandos from the SAS regiment to be parachuted in and call in the airstrikes. The very idea of, of pointing weapon systems at a human being in order to influence their behaviour is terrorism. The idea is that you will frighten them into doing what you want them to do. You will frighten them into not doing what you don't want them to be doing. You are, you are offering to assault and batter and injure and hurt and harm and maim and, and ill-treat them if they don't comply with your wishes. Offering to send a squadron of jet fighters is a bullying terrorist tactic. <coughs> and sending Australian advisors to the Ukraine so that they can train the Ukrainian militia to fight more effectively against the, the Russians, that's completely insane. But that's what our allegedly safety-driven government is indul indulging in and engaging in. And they want us to feel really clever because they say they are scrutinising incoming tourists to Australia who are arriving from West Africa to see if they've got Ebola. It's never occurred to them that somebody who comes to Australia from any country in the world may have met or crossed paths with somebody who was sweating and sneezing and just about to start bleeding after they, the other person has come out of Africa. There's no point only scrutinising people who come here from Africa. You've got to scrutinise everybody who comes here. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, it is a mistake to rely on scrutinising incoming tourists and aircrew. We should institute a system worldwide of quarantining people before they leave any country. And that way the disease stays where it is before you find it, rather than allowing it to spread and then hoping to identify it. For less than $10, you can buy a packet of 100 disposable latex gloves in your local supermarket. I've started buying them with the groceries. Now I'm going to go and find somewhere where I can get disposable masks and a few gowns and something that I can use as disposable bed sheets. Because the Ebola cometh. It just hasn't got here yet. Meanwhile, let's worry about terrorism because we have a terrorism-driven prime muppet. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.